Good evening and welcome to Eastside Prep School, uh, which is located here in the heart of East Palo Alto. My name is Larry Moody and I serve this community as a city council member and former mayor. And I want to welcome you all here for a conversation with our friend Shelly, a very unapologetic conversation with Shelly. Let's give her a hand in advance. <laughs> we certainly want to thank all of you for uh, making a commitment to be here uh, this evening uh, with the way the Bay Area traffic situation is now. It's very easy to say, I'm not going anywhere after work, right? <laughs> but we appreciate you being here, and we uh, anticipate that it's going to be a very uh, inspiring evening. Uh, I want to certainly um, want to thank Carl Welch, um, who many of you probably don't know or won't see tonight, but he is the person that's always been behind the scenes, lifting, lifting up uh, many of the values that we have here in the Bay Area. He was the one to help coordinate our evening tonight here at Eastside Prep School. Uh, he will emerge at some point, and we may even point to him before the evening is over. But uh, join me in advance and giving him a round of applause for bringing us together. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's up there. See? Uh, Eastside Prep School is a, a school we're very proud of here in East Palo Alto. Uh, this school has been in existence for 21 years. Uh, and it was birthed uh, from the idea that every family should have a son or daughter who's a candidate for college admissions. And they started the school, believe it or not, uh, in a very small portable initially with eight students. Today, they serve well over 250 students. As you came here onto the campus today, you probably said to yourself, I never knew this place was here. The great news is that over the years, over the last 17 years, they have uh, achieved 100% high school graduation and admittance into colleges and universities throughout the United States. Yep. We are very proud of the school, uh, and we're really blessed because many of those early graduates of Eastside Prep who went off to Brown University or Stanford University or Columbia, Trinity's and Westlands, San Jose State, Santa Clara's, are now starting to come back into our community. And they're coming back to find a way to use their gifts and talents to lift up our community so that we can be a better and a healthier East Palo Alto. And we're very, very proud of them. Yep. Tonight, Alfredo Garcia will serve as our moderator, self-selected by Shelly herself. Alfredo leads uh, business development and project strategy for Google Home and Nest. In his role, his focus is on building and growing the connected home of the future, powered by the Google Assistant and Google hardware. He joined Google seven years ago and has held many leadership roles in product, business development, and strategy. Prior to Google, he spent eight and a half years in the consumer electronics and medical device industry, working with companies such as General Electric, Stryker Medical and Boston Scientific. He is a 2012 Kellogg School of Management alum and holds a bachelor's degree in electronic, electrical engineering from the University of Puerto Rico. Although he now lives in California, he was born and raised in Puerto Rico. In his free time, he enjoys playing guitar, playing outdoor sports. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this evening, Alfredo Garcia. Here he comes, out of the shadows. <laughs> Thank you for that warm intro. There you go, welcome. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Shelly. Shelly, the former CEO of, of Metric Stream, 
who read, who read Hoffman, the co-founder and former executive chairman of LinkedIn, described as the woman who pulled off the most incredible Silicon Valley turnaround you never heard of. She advises the Royal Bank of Canada <coughs> capital markets as well as growing startups. She is regularly named on the who's who's list in technology. In her spare time, she runs a gourmet dinner club and writes a blog. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you have been partakers, huh? <laughs> she runs a uh, gourmet dinner club and writes a blog that provides career advice, insight, and other musings from her career. She is a co-author. She also co-authored a book, Marketing That Works, How Entrepreneurial <clears throat> Marketing Can Add Sustainable Value to Any Size Company. <laughs> And she has a new book, Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms, coming out next fall. For those here locally, you may not know this, Shelly is a member of our own East Palo Alto YMCA, and along with her husband, Scotty, who served on our board for a number of years with the YMCA, they were very supportive of the capital campaign that made the East Palo Alto YMCA the facility and the reality that it is today. Join me in welcoming our friend, Shelly. Thank you, Larry. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, we are a small but mighty crowd, so I appreciate yes. all of you coming and supporting Eastside Prep because that's who's getting the money that you guys paid for your tickets. So thank you very much for that. And yes. I'm going to turn it over to you, Alfredo. Yes. No, you lead it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay as well? Okay. I feel like someone said earlier, I need to start singing or something or playing the guitar. Uh, I will definitely will not sing. I will not do that to you guys. Uh, so we're excited to be here tonight and talk a little bit more about Shelly's amazing experience, and hopefully you'll take away some great insights and learning from her experience. All right, let's jump right in. All right, I'm ready. Okay. So, Shelly, there are not a lot of successful minority and female CEOs in the Valley, right, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how did you land this in a career? What is your superpower? <laughs> superpower. Wow. Um, superpower. I'd, I'd probably have to say two things. I don't think there's one. The first would be courage. I've, I was willing, I was always willing to step forward, raise my hand, be the first, whatever it might be. I learned early in my life through a lot of experiences that What's the worst that can happen? And when it does, you can actually live with it and survive. And so once you realize that, you're willing to actually take more risks. And that's something that's played out throughout my career. And the second one, I would say, is discipline. You know, I'm very goal-oriented. So you say, how did you get here? I'm very goal-oriented. And I decided early in my life that I actually wanted to run a company and run a business. And a lot of people have goals and make goals. And some people actually put a plan in place to achieve those goals. But very few people make decisions every day that are consistent with that plan. And discipline, I've, that's what I've done. I've made decisions consistent with the plan, consistent with the goal. And I think that's part of what enabled me to actually achieve it and move forward with each, with each step. So you're saying that any regular person can still do that, I, be as successful as you want to. I firmly believe that. They have the courage and the discipline. Mm -hmm. Yep, I uh, firmly believe that. What, what role do you think luck played into that versus your, your hard work and your discipline? Oh, it's, it's all of it. Um, I do think you have the ability at times to improve your chances to have luck. You know, when I think about luck, luck is when you have the right skills, experience, and attitude when an opportunity presents itself. Because opportunities present themselves all the time. But a lot of times we're just not able to see it, to hear it, take advantage of it, for a variety of reasons. So all those things have to line up. 
So I think you can actually make yourself more lucky if you actually open yourself up to what's out there and if you're willing to take those risks and if you've got the right skills and the right experience at the right time, right? All those things come together. So yes, hard work, absolutely. Luck, absolutely. But you need both. Sounds great. And in the same vein, you're also a board director in multiple successful companies, many Fortune 500 companies, or Nordstrom uh, being one of them as well, mm -hmm. Verizon. Um, how did you land those opportunities? And also, what has been the most challenging thing about being a board director in one of these companies? <laughs> okay, so I said earlier I'm <coughs> goal-oriented. So after I actually was on my way in my career, I'm probably in my 30s, when I realized, oh, I thought CEO was the highest level you could reach. And then I realized that CEOs actually report to the board. And I thought, well, gosh, then I want to be a board member. And uh, <laughs> so I set that as the other goal. So once I got my CEO job, I actually started working on getting a board role. Because a board role is a job. And if that's what you're going after, you have to treat it just like going after any other job. So it was telling everyone that I knew that I thought in any way, shape, or form was tied to a company or a board or a CEO or note to say, hey, this is what I want to do. I did my research, because I always believe in doing your homework, which I call my research, but do my research to figure out what are boards looking for? What are the skill sets? What's required? And what have I got and how does that map? And then prioritizing, okay, the two or three skills or background that I thought were pretty strong and telling everybody, here's who I want to be a board member. Here's what I can offer talking to all recruiters, I mean, really treating it like a job. And uh, the good news is I got my first public board seat at 42. So two years after I got my CEO role. And it was, it was what I expected and a lot more than what I expected um, at the same time. And it's been great and I really enjoy it, which is why today I currently serve on four. In terms of what's the, what's the most challenge you know, you, you face a lot of different challenges. There's lots of variety based upon the companies and what they do. Probably the hardest is whistleblower allegations and the investigations behind that. Because there's always multiple sides to any story and any experience. And you can have the exact same set of facts, but how it's interpreted or what it's seen, all that can be a little different. And when you're trying to do it from the outside, not having been on the inside and understanding the dynamics, so hey, that's, that's challenging. So I would I put that as one of the more challenging aspects of what we have to do. Definitely sounds challenging. What would you say, in a similar topic on the luck, right? Um, what role did that play in your career roles that you, you picked, right? So you found a lot of amazing jobs sort of one after the other one, right? and they were all sort of, from the outside looking in, really looks like you wrote this rocket ship, right? So what was your thought process for picking these next roles, right? Did you have it, you know, in mind you had your goals, next role is VP, next role is CEO, next one is board of directors, or how did that happen? Sure, so if I have a roll the clock back. Um, when I joined, so I joined IBM, I decided that IBM was the company I wanted to join because I had gotten advice that if you want an aggressive career, you ought to choose a company that's actually growing in an industry that's growing. And back in the early 80s, industry that was growing was tech. Good news is, it's still tech. <laughs> um, and the company that was the Apple or the Google of the day was frankly IBM. It was the leader in tech back at that time. So I said, great, I'm gonna go be CEO of IBM, as any 21-year-old, right, could, could decide or declare. And that's the way I joined IBM. And then I get there in sales, which, oh, by the way, my peers thought was absolutely crazy. I came out of Wharton, where everybody goes to become investment bankers or big-time P&G product <coughs> managers or all these sexy, cool jobs. And Shelly, you're going to go sell computers, right? What? But the reason I did it was I did my research. And every single CEO at IBM had started out in sales. So that told me that sales was the beginning of the current of the path to get to the CEO job at that particular company. And that's why I started out in sales. And then I joined IBM. And there were like 180,000 people in IBM. And I'm thinking, hmm. they probably, what's that? 
400,000 eventually. When I joined, it was half that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, all of these people probably want to be CEO too. Oh my, yeah, okay, so then you fall back on, you know, I had a, my marketing was one of my concentration areas, and I said, fine, I've got to figure out how I differentiate myself. How do I stand out among 180,000 people um, to indeed be able to drive forward? So I looked around, and honestly, IBM was terrible at marketing. They were terrible at marketing. They called sales reps. My title as a salesperson was a marketing rep. And literally, they just thought anybody could be a marketing person. They didn't have their first chief marketing officer until the mid-90s, which is, shows you how much they didn't value marketing in terms of back then. I didn't have the skill set. So anyway, so I said, I'm going to major in marketing. I need to do all my jobs, but I want to be strong there. So the way I mapped out my jobs was I said, all right, I need a P&L job by the time I'm 30, big P&L job, because that would put me on track. But IBM, you took line, and then you did staff, line, staff as you groomed. And I tried every staff job to get a marketing-oriented job so that I could build some strength and some depth around that. And that proved prescient, because when Abby Comstan was finally hired as a chief marketing officer of IBM, she looked around and said, where are all the marketing people? And guess what? I had a big credentials in marketing, and therefore became part of her initial task force as she tried to build and change IBM's brand and position, et cetera, which was fantastic. So the question about luck? You ask, was that lucky that I got picked? The answer, it was. But it also happened because I was strategic about what skill sets I was building and experiences I had, et cetera. So I tried to keep building on my opportunities as I moved forward with IBM. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds like it was a great um, strategy you brought together. And not only it was the discipline and uh, sort of the courage, but I think you also brought in something that's interesting is the differentiation. So you found sort of how, yes, I have that drive, but if you keep pushing down a wall, the wall won't move, but right? <laughs> you have to find what, what's gonna get me through the wall, and mm -hmm. that differentiation was what really did it for you. So I Absolutely. think that's really great My insight. first executive job was in marketing, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Um, if you were to sort of have a time machine, and you can go back to visit your 20-year-old self and right. your 30-year-old self, uh, what advice would you give yourself at both of those times? Uh, well, the first would be, take all of your vacation every year. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. I, you know, it wasn't until, honestly, probably the last, well, I know what it was, it's probably the last eight years of my, uh, my career in terms of running Metricstream that I actually started taking all my vacation. And you know what? The company didn't fail. <laughs> and you know what? I still had my job. And you know what? It all still worked. It was amazing. But we believe, as we're working all the time, that, oh my gosh, if we take that one day or that two weeks or extend that whatever, that everything is just going to fall apart. And it doesn't. So take the vacation. And the other would be, don't take yourself so seriously. You know, coming out, I was so focused. I had this goal, I had this plan. You know, I was trying to do everything right. And for those of you, and there are some of you out there in the audience that are in my generation, you know, it was all about the pinstripe suits and the white cotton shirts and the little silk bow ties. I mean, we tried to look like the guys in business and execute, I mean, just all of it. And honestly, I think I could have just told myself, just relax a little bit, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Would you tell the same advice to your 30-year-old self as well? Um, I would. I would say, let's see, 30. Honestly, 30, it was, you will survive. I mean, 30 <laughs> was kids and husband and job and life and all. I just feel, I call, you know, there's a certain set of years, I just call them missing years. I never saw a movie. I had no <laughs> idea what the current music was. I, did, I was just trying to survive. <laughs> um, so I would tell my 30-year-old self, you're going to make it. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Uh, now, there, there are rumors that say that, that you're a huge believer in planning. I am. Planning things. Uh, I have not noticed. Some of you know me out there. I have not noticed. Um, can you say more about um, your drive towards planning? Like, what, how did that come by? Was there something in your you know, upbringing that created that, or was it natural? And then how would you advise people... Uh, if you believe that this had uh, a big role in your success, how would you advise people that may not be as great of a planner or may not have that naturally? What are some strategies and things they can do to become better planners? Sure. So, you know, planning was, 
planning was both a strategy and frankly, it, was, it also helped me feel more in control. So it was obvious to me very early in life that the odds were just not in my favor to get what I wanted out of life. And because of that, I had to figure out, okay, fine. I'm not just gonna not get what I want, so how do I improve my odds? What do I do and how does this work? And planning became the way I did that. It was like, all right, set a goal and figure out how do I make that happen? So if the goal is X, what needs to be true for me to achieve that goal, and then how do I make it true? And then execute against that. I mean, it was very, very straightforward, but that's really how I looked at it. And it kept working, so I just kept doing it more and getting better at it, and that just became how I've lived you know, my, my whole life in terms of around both professionally as well as personally on setting goals. Now, I said up front, I'm pretty disciplined. A lot of people aren't, and that's okay. There are still ways that you can take this whole planning concept into your own life if you want to by figuring out, so what does motivate you? What will keep you on track? And I'll give you an example. Because even though I'm disciplined in the whole bit, I still need help. There are times where I don't want to be that disciplined. And one of the ways I do it is I tell people. I tell people what I'm trying to accomplish. And frankly, that peer pressure and the whole knowledge that somebody's going to ask me, well, Shelly, how did you do on such and such? And I don't want to say, oh, well, I did yeah, not Right? You want to be able to say, I did it because I'm pretty proud and, you know, I'm competitive. So figure out what drives you and then use people, use friends, use family, use folks to help you to keep that planning going. So one of my challenge areas was trying to keep, I exercise, and trying to keep my exercises, you know, uh, to, trying to keep them from getting so boring. Um, and so one of the things I started doing was setting a physical challenge to myself, something I couldn't do at the beginning of the year that I'd said, okay, by the end of the year I can do this. But frankly, just doing it with myself didn't help me necessarily, because I knew I had a whole year, and did you really work on it? And so what I started doing was telling people what my physical challenge was. And then everybody was going to ask me at the end of the year, could I do it or did I do it? And frankly, that worked. It absolutely worked, because I was not going to say that I didn't get it done. So. You know, there are ways that you can think about what does motivate you, what does keep you on task, and then use that to then keep you on, on plan or on objective with regards to what you're trying to do. Great. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we were talking a lot about your success and your career. And oftentimes people, when they look at successful people like yourself, they think that you've only had success right? and everything has been riding this Oh, wave. absolutely. This was all easy, smooth as glass, no problems. Sailing, absolutely, right? yeah. Nothing, yeah. nothing hard at all. And uh, oftentimes they miss what's underneath the water, right, mm -hmm. below the glacier. And so uh, can you tell us about what, what has been your biggest failure and how did you overcome uh, it? Gosh. <laughs> Where do you, it's like, okay. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what my first biggest <coughs> failure was. So first biggest failure. I'm at IBM. I told you I was in sales. So... Salespeople have quotas, and you're supposed to make your quota every year. And I was always trying to exceed my quota. Well, this one particular year, my customer was Rite Aid Corporation. You guys know the drugstore chain? And I was selling them point of sale. Well, point of sale means they were buying computers for all of their stores, all of their registers to be replaced, all the back-end systems to support the registers. They had thousands of stores. This was a huge deal. This deal was so huge that it was not only going to kill my number, but my boss was making his number on this deal. His boss was making the number on his, I mean, this was huge. And everybody had come in as a result. I mean, all my, all the senior execs of IBM had come and met my customers. We'd met the CEO. We'd done all this. This is happening. Until. <laughs> so the CEO calls me to meet with me. And I go into, I go up to his office and I get ready to head towards his office. And his assistant says, no, he wants to meet you in the conference room. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> That's never a good sign. And sure enough, we met in the conference room, and he tells me that the board has decided that since they're going to be spending so much money on point of sale, that instead of buying it from IBM, they're just going to invest in a POS company and do it themselves. Right. Oh, no. So now not only do I have this terrible personal blow, because there's no way I'm making this up for this number in terms of this year, but I have to go back to the office 
and I've got to tell everyone that nobody's making their number, <laughs> right? Because I've blown this whole thing. And oh, by the way, everybody knew it. It wasn't just the office, it was the region, it was headquarters. I mean, for those of you in large companies, I mean, everybody knows about this deal. So everybody knows about this failure. So you talk about a failure. Well, I come home, tell my husband, I'm like totally depressed and down. The next day, I go in the office, like I don't even want to go in the office. I mean, it's just horrible. Come home, I'm still down. I'm just, it's just days, right? Probably about the third day, I get home, and I'm still in this crappy mood. And Scotty says to me, what's up? I said, well, babe, what do you think's up? I'm still da 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 And he goes, Shelly. Shelly, that was three days ago. Yeah. Get over it. He said, you are the same person you were four days ago. So why are you beating yourself up? Just go find something else to go sell and make this happen. I mean, he basically did the kick in the butt, right, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I will tell you that what, that what I learned from that and from that experience was he was absolutely right. I was no different. I was absolutely the same person. Yes, shit happens. Mm -hmm. And you just have to deal with it and kind of move on. So one of the things I tell people is I think it's really important, especially